Summary of Prosperity Better Business Makes the Greater Good by Colin Mayer, written and narrated by Janky Mind. Introduction Prosperity delves into the intricate interplay between business ideologies and the prevailing trifecta of societal, political, and environmental turmoil that engulfs us today. Harnessing the reservoirs of historical, legal, and economic acumen, it unfurls an audacious novel paradigm that envisions a harmonious co-flourishing of corporations and the larger communal tapestry. Undeniably, we find ourselves ensnared in an epoch of profound crisis. The vitality of our planet wanes precipitously, while the chasm between affluence and dearth yawns wider than ever before. Evidently, the tapestry of corporate conduct is interwoven with the warp and weft of this exigency. The precepts propelling the corporate sphere have precipitated the degradation of our environment, leaving indelible imprints on communities and distorting economic policy. Yet, the march of time has not always borne witness to this state of affairs, and the corporate archetype is not inherently egocentric. Indeed, corporations possess the latent capacity to affect substantial positive change that redounds to the benefit of many, extending beyond the precincts of mere shareholders. A revision of our extant paradigm is the sole requisite. Within the confines of this audiobook, we will trace the metamorphosis of the corporate archetype from a crucible nurturing communal welfare to one spawning far-reaching and calamitous repercussions. Subsequently, it will illuminate pathways to recalibrate the compass of business ethos, reinstating the corporation as a vessel for societal and economic well-being that reverently accommodates the imperatives of shareholders. Chapter 1, Pioneering a Fresh Business Paradigm Embarking on their professional odyssey, countless aspiring company directors set out each year to attain their coveted MBA. Inaugurating their journey, the first semester introduces them to the Friedman Doctrine, an intellectual legacy of Milton Friedman, the distinguished American economist and statistician. Five decades ago, Friedman unveiled his treatise, Capitalism and Freedom, propounding a notion that has not only underpinned business pedagogy for the past half-century but has also shaped corporate conduct and influenced global governmental strategies. Central to this proposition is the assertion that the exclusive societal responsibility of business is to augment its profits, well within the contours of the law. This principle becomes the lodestar for these prospective corporate stewards. Each decision they make is intended to serve the purpose of profit generation for shareholders. This outlook is so deeply entrenched that it's often considered a fundamental law, an innate and unalterable force akin to gravity. The adherence to Friedman's doctrine has incontrovertibly yielded numerous advantages. Certain corporate stakeholders have amassed substantial wealth, propelling economic growth. In tandem, their enterprises have dispensed employment opportunities to communities and furnished them with housing, sustenance, entertainment, and indispensable services that bolster well-being. Yet, the veneration of this doctrine has concurrently inflicted considerable harm. Its path has exacted a toll on natural resources, imperiling the planet and exacerbating inequalities and privation. Unfortunately, business reporting seldom takes stock of this collateral damage. In keeping with Friedman's precepts, the spotlight is cast solely upon financial and material assets, the assets that engender monetary gains. While corporations may perceive themselves as beholden solely to shareholders, the repercussions of their choices reverberate across entire communities and ecosystems. This dictates a broader accountability towards these communities and the environment. Accomplishing this necessitates a transformation in the business realm, substituting the antiquated paradigm with a novel mindset that redefines corporations and their societal roles. Envision a world where businesses, as an integral facet of their daily operations, prioritize not only profit generation for shareholders but also the propagation of benevolence. While this might sound utopian, it's essential to recognize that humans formulated and embraced Friedman's doctrine. Ergo, it's plausible that we can engineer a novel model that harnesses the affirmative while mitigating the detrimental. 
businesses harbor the latent potential to affect substantial affirmative change on a global scale. The crux lies in redefining the contours of success itself. However, prior to embarking on a discourse about methodologies to actualize this vision, an exploration into the genesis of our current state is imperative. Chapter 2 Severed Bonds Corporations Disconnection from Community the genesis of legally binding groups of individuals for economic endeavors dates back to ancient Rome, but our journey won't extend that far into history. Nonetheless, a brief historical overview can shed light on why corporations have relinquished a portion of their potential for positive impact. A corporation serves as a structural conduit for economic activities. What was once a simple exchange of goods in bustling marketplaces or the collaborative effort of diverse artisans constructing edifices has evolved into incorporated entities subject to formal study and analysis for educational and evaluative purposes. Initially, corporations were instruments wielded by monarchs and legislatures to advance national interests. With the advent of incorporation rights, families could establish their own enterprises, often with the anticipation that succeeding generations would perpetuate the business, nurturing family wealth and offering local employment. The landscape grew more intricate as corporations transcended borders, becoming transnational entities no longer bound by state affiliations. Despite this, many remained under familial control, exemplified by iconic names like Cadbury in confectionery or Barclays in finance. Subsequently, external investors entered the stage, necessitating the cession of control by long-standing business dynasties. Corporations evolved into co-owned entities with stakeholders lacking generational allegiance to the enterprise. Their primary motive centered on securing robust returns on investment. With the passage of time, local branches shuttered and relocated to less expensive labor markets, bolstering profit margins and overall corporate value. Western enterprises turned to sweatshops to curtail production costs, while financial institutions prioritized short-term gains over enduring community benefit through the sale of financial products. This progression exacerbated wealth disparities and saw the environment depleted to fuel the engine of commerce. Lamentably, what has eroded over the course of this evolution is a profound commitment to the community. Corporations, by and large, have severed their identification as integral components within a dynamic ecosystem encompassing an array of stakeholders, proprietors, kin, managers, personnel, suppliers, patrons, and communities. Historically, corporations embraced long-term objectives that nurtured the well-being of a multitude, if not all of these stakeholders, fostering collective prosperity. Regrettably, this ethos has faded. However, the potential for such virtuous action remains innate within corporations. In actuality, it's precisely this aptitude for steadfast devotion to stakeholders, encompassing not only shareholders, that positions corporations as potent instruments for benevolence, should they elect to wield that power. Our exploration will delve into the strategies through which this potential can be harnessed and activated. Chapter 3 Rethinking Purpose Through Effective Governance A fundamental flaw of Friedman's doctrine lies in its propensity to bewilder company directors. When combined with the pressure exerted by shareholders, it leads directors astray, fostering the misconception that the sole purpose of corporations is to amass wealth. Yet, this notion is far from accurate. At its core, the purpose of corporations is to address societal challenges. Whether it's manufacturing washing machines for clean clothes, advancing internet speed, or facilitating seamless travel, a corporation's mission revolves around solving community problems. The goal shouldn't be the mere generation of shareholder profits that should naturally arise as a consequence of fulfilling the primary purpose. Numerous countries stipulate that corporate law should encompass a normative purpose, reflecting a commitment to broader societal good, such as environmental protection or community educational initiatives. However, this commitment often takes a backseat due to shareholder pressure, resulting in token gestures or superficial compliance. 
Therefore, relying solely on normative purpose won't metamorphose corporations into vehicles for positive change. Effective governance must step in. Traditional corporate governance has been inclined towards safeguarding shareholder interests, a stance supported by policy advice in the US and UK. Yet, companies that strictly adhere to these governance norms tend to fare poorly in times of crisis, as evidenced during events like the dot-com bubble burst and the global financial crisis. This conveys a vital lesson, corporate governance should not be geared solely towards enhancing shareholder value, rather, it should revolve around bolstering the company's overarching purpose. Every mechanism embedded within governance, from board composition and appointment to risk management, should be tailored to facilitate the realization of the corporation's authentic purpose, not just the bottom line. Furthermore, corporations must broaden their perspective regarding who their customers truly are. The customer base should encompass all entities impacted by the corporation's activities, including employees, suppliers, local communities, and the environment, not merely direct consumers of products. This inclusive stance fosters innovation and growth, fortifying the corporation against economic turbulence. Effectively aligning a corporation with its true purpose necessitates visionary leadership. This leader, entrusted by both shareholders and employees, spearheads the transformative corporate agenda and underscores its significance. Such an endeavor requires unyielding determination and dedication. However, when successful, it epitomizes genuine business innovation while ensuring the company's enduring prospects. Although studies examining the nexus between socially responsible practices and business vitality are nascent, evidence indicates that a socially responsible approach benefits corporations. Notably, corporate social responsibility, eco-efficiency, and customer satisfaction correlate with elevated returns, diminished risk, and reduced costs. These outcomes resonate with all stakeholders, transcending the realm of shareholders and fostering collective contentment. Chapter 4, Forging New Performance Metrics In the realm of gauging a corporation's performance, the conventional approach fixates on financial and tangible assets. However, a plethora of dimensions influencing a business's trajectory remains uncharted territory, both for better and for worse. Three fundamental resources stand pivotal to a business's survival, in addition to fiscal and material assets natural, social, and human resources. Astonishingly, these linchpins of sustenance are entirely absent from profit calculations, constituting a critical oversight that impacts prosperous as well as struggling enterprises. A comprehensive evaluation of performance necessitates the inclusion of all capital types, encompassing the realms of natural, human, and social resources. Analogous to other assets, the cost of preserving or replenishing these three facets must be integrated into net profits. Similarly, investments in these dimensions must be accorded visibility, be it through employee education initiatives or contributions to the well-being of the local community, which could very well comprise a company's customer or supplier base. This approach is the sole path to attain an authentic comprehension of a business's performance. Just contemplate, would you deem it prudent for your board to make pivotal decisions founded upon an incomplete tableau? Regrettably, this is the prevalent norm in numerous corporations. The result is potentially inflated profits, incorrect allotment to shareholders, and suboptimal resource allocation. More disconcertingly, this deficiency propagates flawed national and global economic policies constructed upon incomplete information. The upshot is perpetuated harm to communities, economies, and the environment. So, how can we rectify this situation and gain a more accurate portrayal of business undertakings? Firstly, corporations must acknowledge the erosion of natural, social, and human capital as liabilities within their profit and loss statements. For instance, if a business rakes in an annual income of $100 million but engenders $30 million in environmental damage, then its recorded income should stand at $70 million. 
Secondly, the expenses entailed in preserving natural, social, and human resources should be recorded as assets. Consequently, if a business expends $40,000 on preserving the health of a river, its natural assets should see a $40,000 appreciation in value. All entities, be they corporations, landowners, or nations, bear the onus of ameliorating the destruction they cause to the community and environment in the pursuit of their commercial endeavors. The cost of this restitution should reflect in their financial documentation, ensuring that profits, liabilities, and assets are precisely tallied. For, in any scenario, the culpable party should bear the responsibility for rectifying the transgression, not the victims or posterity. Chapter 5, Catalyzing Change Through Policy Transformation Amid the kaleidoscope of corporate activities and outputs, there is an omnipresent thread that unites them all, corporate law, the very instrument that brings corporations into existence. Consequently, the realm of law wields the power to mold the modus operandi of corporations, and by extension, their impact on the lives of all those they touch. Corporate law serves as a scaffold, delineating the parameters within which a corporation takes form, arranges its structure, and orchestrates its operations. While this traditional outlook is the cornerstone of the curriculum for our budding MBA aspirants, a more nuanced perspective exists. Beneath the surface lies an often overlooked facet, the law provides a conduit through which disparate entities can conjoin their efforts and commit to realizing outcomes that might otherwise remain elusive. This mechanism echoes the ancient practices of Rome, formalizing commitments through contracts, ownership arrangements, and governance protocols. Further still, corporate entities often espouse corporate commitments, articulating their intentions regarding non-financial facets, sustainability, inclusivity, and the like. Yet, despite these lofty intentions, they frequently fall short. Bereft of contractual frameworks, measurement metrics, designated drivers, and consequences for non-compliance, these commitments often lack meaningful impact. This prompts probing questions, should corporations be mandated by law to conduct themselves in a manner that nurtures and cultivates social, environmental, and human assets alongside their financial counterparts? Should they be legally bound to desist from activities that jeopardize these assets, paralleling shareholders' expectations of directors to safeguard financial worth? And, in the event of damage to non-financial assets, should corporations be legislatively mandated to make amends and restitution? Within the existing legislative spectrum, three paradigms, enabling, empowering, and enforcing legislation, already facilitate corporate commitments. What if we introduce three more, requiring, refraining, and restoring legislation? This comprehensive schema would encompass the needs of shareholders, stakeholders beyond the realm of equity, the local community where the corporation operates, and the broader environment. In turn, directors could more adeptly strike a harmonious equilibrium between their responsibilities to shareholders and the corporation itself. This equilibrium enables shareholders to relish their dividends while the corporation remains unwavering in its mission, delivering innovative solutions that catalyze societal advancement for the collective good. Ultimately, such a reimagined legal landscape orchestrates a symphony where purpose-driven corporations harmonize with prosperity, thriving communities, and a flourishing environment. Summary over the course of history, the corporation's role has evolved from a communal instrument designed to unite individuals for a particular business objective to an entity that primarily prioritizes generating profits for shareholders, frequently at the detriment of others and the environment. However, it's important to recognize that the corporation is an offspring of society. Hence, we retain the capacity to revolutionize its essence into a potent catalyst for positive transformation and aid, all while upholding shareholder interests. Through the embrace of corporate commitment, a reinterpretation of asset stewardship, and a redefinition of corporate accountability, we possess the means to forge a more robust, equitable future that extends its influence across the global panorama. This audiobook summary was brought to you by Janky Mind. We hope you enjoyed it.